What's up, everybody? Welcome in to another video here today, and we're going to be breaking down the dash cam video inside the cruiser at Chad Daybill's house during the search that I had never seen before. We did not see it in Lori's trial and some very interesting admissions and comments and things you can learn and infer from the timing and way that Chad Daybell spoke to his daughter that we're going to break down today and answer questions on. And then we're also going to go through some cross-examination for John Pryor when discussing Tammy Daybell and her demise and the testing that they did and what they did afterwards to try and prove Chad Daybell had something to do with it. And I think he makes some really good points, even if you don't like his style, even if you don't like his demeanor. I think he's at least during some of the witnesses making some decent points for the defense a whole lot better than anything Lori Vallow's lawyers did during her trial. So all that and more on today's video during the lunch break of the Chad Daybell trial. Uh, thank you guys for joining me and let's jump into the video. So this was brought up while the officer was on the stand and the positioning of his car and what's going on at the time is all really important. And they're going to get into that because you see Chad Daybell looking over his shoulder, seeing where they're searching. This is shortly after he was talking on the phone with Lori Vallow saying they're searching around the house and she's like inside the house. And he's like, no. So they kind of know what's coming that they're searching the outside of the house. And again, some of the comments he made, it's really important to point out. They haven't told him what they've found. I think he knows what they found. They haven't told him what he's been charged with. They haven't specifically told him that he's going to jail. They haven't put him under arrest, even though he is in handcuffs. Now you may be able to figure some of that out, but he certainly seems to know a lot about what's going on in this case for somebody who may have done nothing wrong and is maintaining his innocence at this point. Yes, Barbara, thank you for reminding me. Go ahead and hit that like button and we're going to take a listen to this video. Play this, Detective Miller. You see on screen, um, a video let's put in front of the jury yes can you just explain and confirm what that is that's uh my patrol vehicle with chad daybell sitting in the back section where we have our detainees and uh to confirm also is this the day of june 9th 2020 yes is so this is all relative to the search that you've been testifying about already yes thank you you understand why that is yeah so you just take before we get to it i'm gonna wish margarita a happy birthday a lot of birthdays in april and this uh, crew. So I'm pumped you're here, Margarita. And yeah, sit back and uh, let's break this down together. Here with them. Okay. Hi. They said I could talk with you and I didn't want you to be able. Judge, I'm going to stop at one minute, one hour, three minutes, and 17 seconds. And ask a question. Mm -hmm. Detective Wheeler, um, are you aware of who is the person that has just approached Mr. Dave on the vehicle? His daughter, Emma. And as you can obviously hear, the audio is not the best. It's from the inside of a police car. Um, there's a lot of tears going on. And so we're going to do our best to make out everything they're saying. I love you. Glad you came with us. I thought they had taken you downtown already. I got them out to the Fremont County line. You saw it as soon as you left. Again, stopping it. One hour, three minutes, and 38 seconds. Detective Wheeler, can you just explain to the jury um, the positioning of your patrol vehicle relative to the Daybell property and vantage points that could be seen from where Mr. Daybell is sitting as he sits now? So we're parked on the south side of the residence. Uh, I believe the road is 200 north. So we're just south of the residence and uh, facing west. And so if he were to look right outside of that open door, he would be looking at his house. And from his sitting position, would he have a vantage point to see the pond area in his on his property or the fire pit area on his property? From that position, he would just have to look over to his right shoulder and out that door, kind of towards the back of the vehicle. What would he be able to see if he did that? He'd be able to see the the fire pit area for sure. And to be clear, whose remains were found in the fire pit? Um, that was Tylee. I'm going to go ahead and play this uh, continuously for a while. Your Honor. Again, they're trying to get the jury to infer that he's looking back, seeing exactly where he knew the bodies were buried and checking to see if they're searching that area. It's tough to tell when somebody just kind of does something like this, what they're looking at exactly, but they can infer it from the evidence. It's a reasonable argument you can make as the state. Chase, you down and they came back. Ron. Ron. Just 
It's only the car. Huh? I know they. Oh, okay. What's that? Oh, just about the car. Oh, we'll take care of the car. We're we, gonna take. Is it, she able to we'll, get it? Did you have, yeah, you that. We may have to go through the car. If you're arrested in it. Right. Things we gotta do. But then she can, she can have her bananas and her. I gave them the food. <laughs> we'll try to get the car first for you. Okay. You can eat it. <laughs> A lot of little like giggles and laughter. I can understand if it's nervous laughter, things like that. But you're gonna hear him. It's very strange. He talks about his car, his wallet, his cash, his credit card, his Amazon account in a way. And this is kind of the frame I want, you know, the way I would argue it if I was the state. It's almost like when you're planning for a loved one that has passed after their funeral, how you're going to handle things, how you're going to handle the arrangements. Somebody you know is not going to come back. And eventually he makes a comment to that effect, kind of. I do think it was brought out like, again, the quote, I'm not coming back. You know, I, I'm not so sure it was quite that resounding, but the plans and comments and, and conversation that's made at this point really does seem like that's what he's feeling. He's planning for a situation that he is not going to come back to and, and will hear every single step they take, every decision they make kind of has that as the end game. <laughs> so Eric, wrong so like my wallet will that be able for her to pick up or could i turn yeah. that over to her right now and then cards that here it's right here that's it's up to you i don't see can i look through it sure there's going to get marked uh, oh. is there anything you're going to need in that well she'll be running my finances i suppose so so he's giving her the wallet he's saying she'll be running my finances that has a little money on it you could Okay, just, so these are credit cards, so you're good if you just take them. Yeah. Correct. Um, in the middle drawer on the left side in Mark's room, there's about $9,000 in two white envelopes. $9,000. Not sure how, if he's not making money on his book, and, you know, I don't think Lori had a job and things like that. We know Tammy obviously had this life insurance policy, which. This is all kind of centering around motive and why he did it and how he did it and, you know, why so many people had to be involved to get certain people out of the way. Other people lost their life potentially for money and they're setting all of that up with this. And I thought this video specifically had a lot of revelations in it that help with that motive a lot. Now, I don't think he thought there was any illegality to that $9,000 in this video because he says it right in front of the cop and with the camera there sitting in the back of the cop car. I don't know whether or not he knew he was being recorded, but. The cop was right there, obviously, when he told his daughter this. Okay. Um, so get that. Yeah. So. Yes, Jacqueline. This is as they're they're actually searching his house right now. They're continuing to search the property right now. They have already found the body, which is why he is in handcuffs in the back of the car. But they haven't told him what he's charged with or finished their search yet. We'll talk more about the car payments and stuff, but you have that password. I do. I believe the Hawaiian That's this one. First Hawaiian Bank. If you use that same password for this account, it's Chad Abel. He also talks about a bank account he has at First Hawaiian Bank. Again, they moved quickly after Tammy's death. All this stuff starts happening, which is I think the state's timeline is very firm and makes a lot of sense. And I think that's you know one of their best arguments. Uh, Lane says, I found the lieutenant yesterday seemed like a bad witness. Uh, like I was shocked he was the boss of the detectives. He doesn't seem very confident slash professional of a police witness. I do think that some of their witnesses haven't felt the strongest. And I actually think some people have told me they think Pryor is really condescending and they don't like how he's doing things. It's not the perfect style, but I do think he's making some points. And I listened to a lot of the Lori Vallow trial, not the whole thing because we couldn't watch it. So there were some parts that I missed, but it seemed like a line them up, knock them down, home run, easy win for the state. Not to say the state's not going to win this case, but it absolutely thus far seems more difficult. I know it's not the same exact prosecution team as well. And the prosecutor I think I really liked in Lori Vallow's case is not is no longer with the office, but it definitely seems like a harder battle than Lori Vallow's trial. Um, that's what I was thinking. Um, the producer there. This has nothing on it. Six dollars. That has to go away. So this, okay, in that same drawer. You can grab it. 
is a piece of this that would fit in here, and it's got a company card, company business card. And so just make sure you get that. Um, and this is all in orchestra. Yeah, I put that in there. There's a like a pamphlet with um, a guy who's sitting in a car. It's for the Wells Fargo Auto Loan. That's the loan that they keep going up. Yeah, and so that we'll talk about. So this has, if you go to Tellmate, this is the card that's used. Okay. And so all you really do, you could probably just sign in as Chad Davell or start your own. I have an account that I've been talking with Lori on. Okay. So then. They're talking about basically putting money on Lori's commissary and use this card to do it. And here's his login. And his daughter's like, oh, I've got one of those. I talked to Lori on it. That's really interesting to me. Especially because in Pryor's opening statement, and if you look at the defense witness list, multiple children of Chad Daybell seem to be testifying in his defense. And I believe Emma is one of them. Who's talking to him here? And she's also been talking to Lori Vallow. Now, what's interesting about it as well is it seems like Chad Daybell didn't know that Emma was talking to Lori Vallow. Is anybody passing messages for them now? Anything cryptic going on? I don't know, but this definitely adds some side-eye to the situation. But you could use this card. Yeah, and to her if needed. Okay. So yeah, she'll need to still have commissary money. Usually that's 30 a week in there. And, and he's saying, you know, make sure you make sure she has commissary money. Take care of Lori. Um, he's really focused on Lori. And I agree, Stacy. That is wild to think he if he knows, right? If he knows what the cops are uncovering right now, and this is how he's acting, feels cold blooded to me if I'm on the jury. Now. The other argument would be like, he's acting so nonchalant because he has no clue what they're finding. He thinks it's just animal bones back there. And if there was no other context, then maybe that'd be a good argument, but I think it's going to be tough. You can probably talk to her too. Okay. I'm crying. I love you so much. It is really sad, like really sad. If, I mean, if you're sitting there thinking and you're the daughter and you don't think your dad did anything, I mean, it's brutally sad. It's more sad for the children that he allegedly hurt. But uh, Francis, do you think the defense is just trying to keep Chad Dable off death row? I think it's possible. I mean, I think you first try to win and then once you lose, you try to keep him off death row. But yeah, that could be in the back of his head. Um, Bendy Fetty, is this going to be a long trial? I can't remember how long Lori's went for. Trial was hard to follow, not being able to see. This is a death penalty case. Yeah, yes, a death penalty case. I think they said eight to 10 weeks. Cooperate with them as much as you feel. You know I mean? So he said, cooperate with them as much as you feel you can. So an interesting comment as well, if you know what's going on. If you don't know what's going on, sure, tell your daughter to cooperate. No harm, no foul. You've got nothing to hide. Why would he say it as like a, was that just like a, he was trying to mess with the cops? Like, yeah. Cooperate with them. I don't I don't really get how that shows, you know, consciousness of guilt, but you know, there's gonna be some follow-up questions here that are gonna try to make it sound worse. Um, it's just I didn't feel like that was that damning personally, just because he's told his daughter to cooperate with them. What did you want him to say? Don't cooperate with them, don't speak to them. That would have been, you know, looking worse for Chad Debo. I'm stopping at 10758, Your Honor. Detective, based on your knowledge. At this point that day in the search, had law enforcement asked for any cooperation from Emma? I can't testify to that because I don't know the extent of that. Fair enough. Then knowing that just to you, had you asked her to do anything or asked for any kind of cooperation from her? No. Thank you. They've been kind to us today. She said they've been kind to us today. Okay. I texted uh, John Pryor, so he has my number. He said thank you. Okay. So John Pryor is involved from day one, from the jump. It's, I'm always interested. So tell me how you guys feel about this, because for me as a lawyer, it doesn't bother me at all. But 
as potential jurors in whatever jurisdiction you live in. And for these jurors that probably have not a lot of experience with the legal process and legal situation and legalities, what do you think when you hear a guy's name that you know that you've been watching in trial that you realize represents Chad Daybell as his criminal defense attorney? And you hear that he was texting him and his daughter was texting him immediately, even before the search potentially. What do you guys think about that? Is that a good thing, a bad thing? I'm really interested to hear your responses on that, number one. Number two, people are asking, he wasn't read Miranda. How can they use all this? Well, in case we haven't noticed yet, there's no cop sitting there asking questions. He's just talking. And maybe they're letting him talk to his daughter as a strategic move to see what he says, see what else they can find out about him. They recorded his phone call when he was talking to Lori because it's a jail call. Very interesting to me. Ash, you don't have to keep sending your super chats. I'm, I was going to wait till the end to hit that question. So I will answer you at the end. I just don't want to throw a little wrench in here in the middle of the uh, video, but I will answer you at the end. A lot of the company stuff that pays for the house, should this auto pay still out of that uh, company account? I left 5000 in there. Okay. You need some compliance. Okay. Thank you. Nirvana said, repeat the question. My question was, do you look at it negatively that he was already, and his daughter was already reaching out to John Pryor, same name, same lawyer he has representing him right now at this moment, no charges, hasn't been formally arrested. They're just searching his house. Now he's in handcuffs in the back of a cop car. So in my opinion, it's normal to contact a lawyer, but I want to know what you guys think. Any other questions you have? I think, well, it sounds like you're not going to be out. I'm right. <laughs> so I think I'm going to, my landlord texted me. So again, the I'm not coming back quote, I, I didn't hear it there. Maybe he says it somewhere else, but she says, it seems like you're not coming back and we'll listen to it again. And he says, correct. This is kind of the consciousness of guilt that the state really is hanging on to. Other questions you have? I think... It sounds like you're not going to be out. Right. <laughs> so I think I'm going to, my landlord. It seems like you're not going to be out. He says, correct. And you may be able to argue, maybe she means tonight. Maybe she means in an hour. But right after this, they start talking about her moving out of her house with her husband into his house, taking over living life for his house because he's not coming back to his house like ever, it sounds like. So I'm looking at the the reviews, the reviews and the comments are a little mixed, but most of you think it's normal and appropriate to contact a lawyer when cops show up to your house and you get handcuffed and put inside the backseat of a cop car, which I would agree with. But some are looking at it negatively. So we'll see how the jury ends up looking at it. But from my opinion, I didn't necessarily hear him say, I'm not coming back. He may have said it at a different point, but his actions and the entire kind of theme of the conversation would lead you to believe he knows he ain't ever coming back. He ain't ever getting out texted me just to feel bad for me. I think I'm going to come over here. That's what I needed you to say, because, yeah, you and Joe. Stopping at 10904, Detective Wheeler, I just want to reiterate, we just heard that comment about he's not likely going to be out. At that point in time, you had not formally put him under arrest. Is that right? Aside from placing him in handcuffs and detaining him, no. But you didn't advise him of potential charges or anything like that? At that no. Point? And as far as you know, had any other law enforcement advised him of any specific charges that he may be facing? Not that I'm aware of, no. Thank you. So again, they said he said he's not coming back. I definitely think that's the context of the conversation. But nobody had told him what he was charged with. So again, that's consciousness of what's going on. But it could also be you know what Alex Cox did. You know what Lori Vallow did, and you just didn't rat him out. So is that really a conspiracy? Did you really take part in it? Did you really know what was going on? Things like that. So many people are commenting after watching you. I would definitely be contacting my lawyer, which I agree with. I think you should. Um, I think you absolutely should from minute one. Uh, Brianna said, someone in the chat challenged the admissibility of the webcam. Can you expand on that? Thanks. So I don't know if, uh, if they commented before or after I said, so this is not custodial. They're not asking him questions. This is not an interview to elicit uh, potentially criminal or incriminating responses. They haven't read him Miranda. They haven't formed him with charges against him. They've just basically contained him while they're searching his house because of what they have found. They could say it's for potential safe, safety reasons. They don't want him to leave. Um, and he's just talking to his daughter. 
and body cams and police cars. They have cameras in them. You don't have the same expectation of privacy in this situation. So there's nothing wrong with them recording him. And it is his statements. Now, if they want to say Emma's statements are hearsay, they could have kept them out, but they give context to the situation. They don't have to necessarily be true, but their effect on Chad Daybell based on his answers. But yeah, I don't see anything wrong with playing this video. And whatever Mark wants to do, <laughs> he should stay with me here. Oh, really sure Mark, you don't take care of me. That's the card. I will. That's. <laughs> don't take care of me. Don't but, take care of me. Then thank you. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> so, keep paying the mortgage out of the company. Oh, no. no, you can probably set it up though. Okay. Um, I'm trying to. It's the Wells Fargo in that same pamphlet. Oh, look, but, but I've had a lot of success with mom stuff just saying, Will you help me? My mom died. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Will you help me? My dad's in jail. <laughs> it should be paid. I mean, again, I think that's nervous laughter after his daughter, but just think about how sad that is. I've had a lot of success just saying, Yeah, my mom died. So I think I'll just say, My dad's in jail, and that'll help me get through things. I mean, that's the life of these kids. I feel. I feel really horrible for them. And again, I'm sure they didn't think that their dad was what he is allegedly being accused of at this point and feeling this way. So it is, I mean, it's really sad to watch this and hear this interaction, wondering what the heck is going on in the minds of all of these people. And Chris said, my first impression of Chad on video is he doesn't strike me as a criminal mastermind. I agree, but a follower of Lori, in my opinion, I don't know about a follower of Lori. I definitely think his position of author speaker she was drawn to, but I, I mean, I, I can see, and I, I heard some pushback. It's like, of course, everybody wants to blame the pretty blonde lady for being manipulative. It's like the way their trials are going. The fact that John Pryor and Chad Daybell are pointing the finger at Lori Vallow and Lori Vallow refused to, to me, even more so says he felt like he was potentially manipulated by her. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what happened, but I, I do agree that he does not strike you as some kind of, you know, puppeteer moving everything around on a chessboard to make sure it all works exactly according to his plan. Paid through July 1st. Okay. And I think the car is paid through July 15th. Yes, I do know that she's an adult. It's still still sad to me. Um, so you shouldn't have any bills to worry about. Um, yeah, I... I'm not coming back. So all that stuff there that's in is. the baby room. There it is. There it is. Yeah, I'm not coming back. So he just flat out says it. Yeah, I'm not coming back. So here's how much the car is paid up for. All the stuff that's in the baby room, that's me and Lori's, you can get rid of it. She's not coming back either. He doesn't say that, but you can infer based on what he says to do with her stuff. They're not coming back. Honestly, above just about anything else, that to me shows consciousness of guilt. It would be so hard with all the evidence they have, everything they're going to present. I'm keeping an open mind. We're not convicting him. He's presumed innocent. But that is, to me, the biggest revelation of the entire trial. His own words, unsolicited, uncoerced, unforced by law enforcement, speaking to his daughter before he knows what he's charged with, while the search is ongoing at his house, literally minute one to his criminal prosecution, and he knows, I'm not coming back. And he proves he believes it, and it wasn't just some psychotic event. By all of the instructions and actions and words he's telling his daughter in this conversation, this is literally gold. This is almost as good as a smoking gun for the prosecution in this case. That's why I thought it was as important enough to focus basically an entire video around it. These comments mixed with the context. The lorries and mine, the suitcases you'll see oh, in the box, is. just put it in the garage, I guess, after. Store it, see what happens. You, you guys can, yeah, take that mattress from upstairs, I guess, do what you want, put the books back on the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to make it through. I, you probably can. He's like, you do whatever you want with those books and like that mattress and stuff. Cause you know, I guess it doesn't matter anymore. It's like, what? It literally is like, I, 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 my mind just goes to all these like analogies 
but it's like you're preparing for the playoffs and you have all the playbooks out and it's like, oh, well, we lost our last game. So I guess we can throw those playbooks away because we don't need them now. It's like very strange, very strange reaction, knowing what happened. It wasn't just you missed the playoffs and there's going to be next year. The two lives, multiple lives, but the two kids that they're finding right in these moments. And this is the demeanor and the conversation is eerie. Oh, they let you think he started crying and we said, Oh, do you want to talk to him? And he's like, Can I? He said, He's just over there. He's like, oh, that's changed us. Like, he probably saw us. Yeah, I was watching. <laughs> and, um, boy, things will slow down for you guys and get left alone. And, but yeah, they'll let you move out of there. You just get over here. You get gosh, well, I <laughs> stuff will better. I would be moving too. That's what the spirit was telling me, but I didn't know how it would. I felt like I needed to learn more. Mm. And now I get it. <laughs> so, yeah, this is essentially your house. And we'll talk to John Pryor about the financial arrangement, but you should be fine for a while. I think long enough to get. And we know everybody's talked about the money and dealing with John Pryor, so we need to rehash that now. I have a lot in that account with the other attorney, so that will take care of me for a while. And maybe we just do a refinance on the house or a home equity loan. I don't think it's going to break us. I think that might be an option there. I might need to authorize putting you on the mortgage. Just probably leave Joe off it. Yeah. Yeah, keep me on it with you. And Do you have accounts like that when you're in jail? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I guess this is the part you got to get under someone else's right. account. Well, it's actually Spring Creek Book Company's office, so you can. We'll manage it that way. We'll find a lot of And you have an You can send things through Amazon to the jail. Yeah. So like I couldn't send you a package, but Amazon, if I ordered it through there, it could get to you. Yeah. So I'll only do that as you ask for stuff. So again, they're talking about sending him care packages when he's in jail, how much money he's got on his Amazon account. Again, all preparations for somebody that's not coming back. Lori would know the Amazon account. I'll talk to her. Yeah. Because I have like $265 or so in there as gift certificates. So don't pay. Yeah, I won't. We'll get it figured out. It's like the show level 11 of five. <laughs> Same as for Lazelena at iCloud.com, I believe is the password. They, I don't know what they're going to do with the computers. You could probably, it wasn't part of the search warrant. Are they, do you know, are they leaving the computers? Well, they were in my yeah. bag. They were in the car. We'll probably go on the road and try to get them Okay, but things that are currently in the house will likely be left. I don't know what they're going to take out Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> when we clear from here, whatever's in there. It, it'll be left. Okay. I talked to them and told them the bedrooms and do not mess it up. And they didn't seem like they were going to loom it all at all. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I get Garth and Beth moved. <laughs> and you guys come over here. It'll work out. It's all in the Lord's hands. It also is just, I mean, the daughter's obviously crying and, and breaking down a little bit, but he's like, it'll all work out. It's fine. I just got to go away for a little bit. Almost like this, we knew this was a, a chance of happening. That's what it feels like to me. Like, we knew this was a potential for happening. We'll talk. Use, <laughs> use <laughs> that cellmate. <laughs> um. I don't know if I'm Madison or Fremont. I think they're deciding that right now. But. That's what it sounded like. Detective Ball wouldn't, or Lieutenant Ball wouldn't say because he didn't know. They just don't know which jail he's going to. I'm sure Fremont has a filming system. So. Well, at Fremont, when I went in to get fingerprinted to teach, I was like in there, like in the jail. <laughs> I was like in my like teacher clothes. This is a little recent grad. So I don't know what they do. 
Sorry, all the neighbors are going to be talking. But he, just... he looks back and he says all the neighbors are going to be talking. The state comments on him looking back and they think he's looking at the area where they're searching. Again, worrying about the neighbors talking at this point. <laughs> We're okay, Dad. Um, We're okay. You raised us that we're independent now with your wallet. <laughs> Glad you got that. We're not right. Forget get that money out of there. Probably just put it in your own personal account um, rather than have the cash laying around. Do you need some? I think they've been okay with talking with her. I'm, I might not tell Joe about it either. <laughs> About the money, yeah. No. I have an account that's just in my name. I'm just gonna put it in there. Wait, well, Garth knows about that money. Um, Garth doesn't send this for both ways, Joe. The checkbooks are in that drawer, too, if needed, but you shouldn't need them. If at some point you feel you need to clear out the Hawaii account or something, you can check my email. Yeah, I have that computer, but my email that Rexburg password is pretty much is that everything. Okay, for the bank or my email. Cholo, I don't know why, but I think I switched to all of those. Um, yeah, I talked to Lori just for like two minutes. So she's aware they were searching. Was she surprised? So now he starts to talk about where they're searching. Um, and he talked to Lori, which we're going to get into. Lucia, this was my first thought too. If this really happened here, um, I'll pass on the free house. Uh, Krista, to me, calling a lawyer right away isn't a good or bad thing, but would raise some questions. Why do you have a relationship with a criminal defense attorney? Prior needs, prior need for one or anticipating the need um, or not, and you just know he's a good one. Right, could be a lot of things. Now, I don't know if they'll get to explain this, but obviously Lori is already in jail. She has already been arrested and Chad has been implicated. So I don't think it's crazy, obviously, if you know those context, the, those context issues that or context clues that that's why he could have a criminal defense attorney, but the jury likely doesn't know that. So that's kind of, kind of why I wanted your guys' immediate reaction to what you thought, knowing that he already had the number of a criminal defense attorney and was ready to use it. Show a little, I don't know why, but I think I switched to all of those. Um, yeah, I talked to Lori just for like two minutes. <laughs> So she's aware they were searching. Was she surprised? She seemed bothered or disturbed. I mean, so I told Lori they were searching. She seemed bothered or disturbed. Again, these are things, and we're still trying to look up little little snippets that the defense could argue. So they could argue Lori knew exactly where the kids were and what was going on, why she was disturbed. Chad didn't. Yeah, but, but um, so yeah, I'll be fine. I don't know what they told you because I asked Lieutenant Ball, where did you find the human remains? Because that's what they told me, is that they found human remains. And I said, well, there are several dogs that have been buried there. And he said, respectfully, Emma, I can tell the difference of human remains. And I asked He says he finds human remains. The daughter's like, well, several dogs have been buried back there. He's like, respectfully, I know the difference between human remains and dogs. I don't know that the daughter was arguing with what he was finding or what he was saying, but that's interesting. Where was it? And he said over by the pond under that tree that mm. it was in the ground and had boards over it. Mm. Okay. But that that didn't. Jason and I have walked all over over there. Mm. Yeah. That, and mm. I can see in your face that surprised you because they asked, "Do you want to know what he's charged for?" And then they went, "Well, actually, we don't have it." So she says audibly that I could tell that surprised you when Chad found out about it. And then she asked, or they asked her, do you want to know what he was been charged with? She said yes, and then they didn't end up telling her. Patty said, for me, this is so strange. The conversation is happening when they're finding two children's bodies in the yard. Do his adult kids not get it? I mean, you have to believe they don't get it at this point. I don't know though. I mean, I, I just, I don't, I don't, there's a lot of things I can explain, a lot of things I can break down and dig into, but what's going on inside people's heads is, is a tough one. It's a tough one. Said we don't want to tell you something wrong. And so he told me that the what they're looking at is that they found one body with the probable cause. There's likely two. So I asked, are you going to search the property forever until it's found? And he said, 
well, no, but we're going to look. And he said, because I said, what about, this is the home for my siblings, and there's a baby. And he said, if you're not able to get back in tonight, we'll hook them up with a hotel. He said, you're not in trouble. I think they'll let them back. I, there's nothing in the house. They Stopping up. <clears throat> I think they'll let you back because there's nothing in the house. Nothing in the house. Means he knows there's something outside the house and he knows they've already found part of it and that they're close to finding the rest. I think there's easy dot connecting and arguments that the state can make in closing arguments with those points. He knew he was planning that he wasn't going to come back. Daughter was going to come in the house. He knew they were going to let her come in the house and not bother her because he knew there was nothing in the house. They weren't going to find anything in the house. That's why he and Lori, Lori were disturbed that they were searching outside the house and why he kept looking over his shoulder to see where they were searching. It all tracks. At one hour, 19 minutes and 17 seconds. Detective Wheeler, at that point, to the best that you can recall, was any of the search focused inside of the house? Not that I can recall. So the focus, as based on your memory, was all outside of the house. Correct. Okay. Focused on that. The focus, as, was any of the search focused inside of the house? Not that I can recall. So the focus, as based on your memory, was all outside of the house. Correct. So the focus of the search was all outside of the house. Max Banks said, why are they allowing this conversation? If you mean law enforcement, if a criminal defendant is just going to talk, 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 and you got him on camera perfectly, you know where your cameras are positioned and he just wants to talk, they let him have it. And again, he sees his daughter there. Maybe he feels bad for the daughter. They're trying to figure out the finances and what's going to happen and how they're going to, I mean, not all cops are jerks. They don't have to allow this conversation. Absolutely not. They don't have to. They can. He's cuffed in the back of a cop car. Where's he going to go? So I don't know if it was strategic or if it was just by happenstance or maybe predetermined or ordained that this conversation was going to come out in court one day and his own words immediately when this was happening, we're going to come back to haunt him. Focused on the house at all. We've kind of been looking in it in the yard. Yeah, I mean, Mark gets back. I wouldn't mind. Uh, yeah, I, I think we're okay coming over. We just have to have law enforcement escort us onto the scene. And... Mm -hmm. We'll make it through. Mark deals with trauma weird that he just acts vaguely unimpressed. So I called him and said, Dad got arrested. And he said, Well, I guess I should come home. <laughs> yeah, Mark, you should. <laughs> I mean, could you imagine reacting that way when somebody tells you your dad got arrested? It's just strange. It's just strange. I don't know what it means, but it's strange. Yeah, you don't need to go. Yeah. I don't want to. Joe is home. He's home and he has Jake. Garth and Seth went in Garth's car to pick up Mark. So if you can get back a couple seconds. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, just in the... Let Mark use the Equinox or however you rearrange the cars. <laughs> but I, yeah, it's all a matter of timing. It seems to come together. But it's all good. Thank you very much. Thank you for letting me speak with him. And again, she says to the cops, thanks for letting me speak with him. You want to talk to your dad? You want to do this stuff? You want to have the cops be nice? Be nice and respectful to them. Right. And she was like, thank you so much for letting me talk to my dad. Maybe that's why they let the conversation go. Maybe it wasn't strategic at all. Maybe they were being polite throughout the entire search and they knew they had him. So let him talk to his daughter. I don't know. There's nothing wrong with this, but they also don't have to allow it. Just, yes. Just want to tell me once I'm available to talk. We can talk. So, thank you. Love you. And stopping at 121.16, for the record, I'm going to advance to 121.39. 121.36. Detective Will, I just invite you to watch carefully what uh, Chad does, and I'm going to stop and let you explain any significance to that. Stopping at 12147. Detective, um, what direction is Mr. Daybell looking when he just turned his head and looked back? 
It appears to me he's looking over to the fire pit area. And that is in fact. I mean, that's kind of like makes me eye roll a little bit. He went like this. Oh, he's looking directly at the fire pit area. It's like, okay, not that it matters and they don't need it, but that's a bit of a press, especially when last time he looked over, he said, I'm sure all the neighbors are going to come out here and be talking about it. So if anything, it's referencing him looking back at the neighbors since that's what he said. And we're assuming the rest of the stuff was true that he said in this video, but whatever. They try to use him looking back saying he was looking right at the fire pit area. There's no doubt based on his comments, he knew they were looking outside, outside the house, not inside the house. Uh, but again, I felt like that was a little stretch. Um, so major blow to the defense's case. But now let's take a listen to um, some good points made by the defense. When the officer was called that uh, dug up Tammy Daybell's remains, I thought John Pryor made some really good points. And I, I did think that this would be the most difficult um, part of the case to prove only because it was officially determined that it, her cause of death was not a homicide at first and they were going to have all these reports and things like that. Um, now again, they have evidence that will fit, especially I think when it all fits together in the big picture, I think the jury will probably be able to find him guilty of this too, if they find him guilty of everything else. Um, but let's take a listen to part of this cross. Did you take the time to look at Tammy Daybell's death certificate? No, I did not. You didn't consider that? No. So you looked at some medical records and said she has anemia and she's on Prozac. And you looked at Officer Greenall's report, right? Yes but you didn't look at any death certificate. No. Did you read Brenda Dye's report? No, I did not. Did you read Officer Greenall? Brenda Dye's the coroner. So he didn't look at the death certificate, didn't look at the coroner's report. This report? Yes, I did. Okay, so when, you, when it, so when you took into consideration of why you dug up Tammy Daybell, and by the way, just before we get there, Tammy Daybell's children were never notified that you were digging their mother out of the ground, were you? No, there was not. Yeah. So her own children were not advised. So that's not really relevant to whether or not Chad Daybell did this, but it does make them look like jerks and maybe make them feel bad for Chad Daybell and his kids. You know, so just maybe some sympathy points for the defendant. I don't know, but it definitely doesn't prove whether or not he committed this intentional homicide. Advised that. So her own family were never advised that you're digging their mother out of the ground without, without letting them know in any shape, form, or, or, or opportunity to respond. Is that right? Yes. I'd like you to look at the um, the certificate of death, and I'll oops, and I'm going to point down to uh, where it says the cause of death. You see my arrow down there? Yes. Okay. And the cause of death, they I'm list. Putting Cheryl's comment up here because a lot of people sending me messages just like this. There's two things on the cause of death for Tammy Daybell's death, and would you read those out loud? What those two are? Cardiac event and pulmonary edema. Okay. Heart issues, right? Yes. And you saw that in the medical history of of uh, Tammy Daybell, her father had a history of heart disease, right? Yes. So you didn't take that into consideration when you decided to dig Tammy up out of the ground, right? No, I've never seen this before. You never looked at it? No. You never talked to anybody about uh, what was, uh, what the death certificate said before you decided to have her dug up, right? Correct. And you went- That's wild to me. They didn't even look at the, it's like they didn't even care what it said. They didn't even care if it was plausible, if it was true. They were like, you know what? Forget it. We've got enough context to exhume her body. And Pryor kept saying things like dig it up. And again, it was making it kind of like crass and cringy, but I think he's trying to make the point here with that. And in front of a judge and you put on testimony, like it said before you decided to have her dug up, right? Correct. And you went in front of a judge and you put on testimony to justify digging her up out of the ground. And you didn't even as once look at the certificate of death, did you? No. Okay. All right, I'm going to jump ahead just a couple minutes while he kind of fumbles through some papers until they get other reports up that he's going to want him to read through here. The deceased. I'm sorry, up here where it says the deceased. Uh, yeah, so he's going to tell him where to kind of start reading. Uh, make sure everybody hit the like button if you guys haven't already um, and subscribe to the channel. Jay Santana said, just got home from serving jury duty. That's pretty awesome. Uh, welcome Emily and a lot of the new members that joined today. It's always awesome to see the new members coming in a fun members only live coming this month. Deceased. That's where I'd like you to start. You want me to read the whole paragraph? The whole paragraph, if you would. Please. Okay. This deceased Tamara M. Daybell was found by her husband, Chad G. Daybell. Chad told me Tamara had been sick and had a severe coughing fit at approximately. So this sounds really good. I think this is from the coroner's report, but if you break some of it down, a lot of it is just Chad Daybell saying what happened which at the time they had no reason to believe it wasn't true. Now, maybe not so much, but still 
it's pretty good piece of evidence for criminal defendants because we've watched, and again, probably better than anything that was argued in Lori Vallow's case. Zero hundred hours. During this fit, she vomited, then she returned to bed and she said she was fine. At approximately 540 hours, Chad felt the blanket slide off the bed and woke up to see Tamara had partially fallen off the bed. Chad told her to get up and when she didn't answer, he turned on the lights and found that she was deceased. She had partially fallen off the bed, her head was touching the floor and her feet were still on the bed. Chad said, Chad said she was cold and stiff. He called for his son to help come come help put Tamara back onto the bed. Chad then called 911. Okay. So when you talk about a lack of medical conditions, did you read this report before you went to, to a judge and get an order digging Tamara Daybell up out of the ground? Yes. Okay. So did you did you happen to notify the judge that Tamara was having fits the night before she was vomiting and was sick and was generally not doing well? Did you mention that to the judge? No. Okay. So he went and said some things to the judge that I think John Pryor's got a good argument that either weren't true or they didn't do enough of an investigation to look into. Was there actually certain things or did Chad Daybill say things that they have reason to believe was not true? He just kind of didn't mention a lot of things or didn't know about a lot of things or didn't even look in some of the right places like the coroner's report of the death certificate. All right. So we'll move on to the, we'll move on to the second paragraph now. And if, and if you would read the second paragraph, starting with Chad said Tamara. Chad said Tamara didn't have any serious medical conditions. She was taking fluoxetine for depression, but did not have any other prescriptions. Chad said the last time she was at the doctor was approximately two months ago when she had fallen in the driveway and injured her arm. The doctor had given her steroid shots and she was not having further issues. Chad said she had been feeling sick with something like a cold lately and that she would have gone to the doctor today. Chad said she has low blood pressure and faints occasionally. Chad said that she has been going through menopause and also has been having aches and back pain for approximately two weeks and that she was going to visit the chiropractor soon. Chad said she didn't go to the doctor often because she didn't like doctors. And, and you were aware of that based on the research of her medical records that Tammy Daybell didn't like to go to the doctor, did she? Yeah. Right. And you were... So again, some corroboration that that's true. She didn't go to the doctor often. She, you know, treated with more homeopathic things, um, which they found a lot of that in her cabinet. So a lot of this is tracking here that this medical history and a lot of the things Chad Daybell said was actually true and proven and things that he probably didn't think somebody was going to go back and search all her records. Because if you say somebody doesn't like to go to the doctor... And like, I've got some clients that go to the doctor multiple times a month. It's like, well, they go to the doctor a lot, whether they like them or not. You don't always know. Sometimes you just need to go to the doctor, but some people that really hate doctors and you can tell they go to the doctor once every five years or something that they don't go to the doctor often. And if somebody says they hate the doctor, that's why they don't want to go. They try to treat it homeopathically. You can prove that with a lack of medical records. We're aware that Tammy Daybell would use herbal medicine and oils and other medications in lieu of going to the doctor to try to try to cure herself in other ways, untraditional ways, right? That's what the report said, yes. Right. So instead of going to the doctor for fainting spells and for, for these other things that were going on, she would take supplements and do things like that, right? Yes. Okay. And then I'll go back down. And the next one. So Lisa H., a lot of it is Chad said, but not all of it. And some of the Chad said is actually corroborated by some, you know, third party that wouldn't know what was going on as far as the context of this case. Talks about Chad showing all of the over-the-counter medications she takes. He said she's taken approximately 10, bo 10 bottles on the tablet every morning that she takes to help her. Okay? And then read the last line where it says most. In that, that paragraph I just read where the last sentence says most of, the, of what was. Most of what was in the cupboard. Oh, Mr. Pryor, you turn that side. Oh, so you can't that's, that makes it tough, doesn't it? I was okay. trying to pull one on you, apparently. <laughs> Go ahead. Most of what was in the cupboard was essential oils and natural remedies and some pain medications. So again, it kind of lines up with what they found in the cupboard as well. Okay. So it, it looks like the list below talks about uh, the Prozac, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, vi whatever vitality extracts are. But at the very bottom, it says supplement, right? Yes. And what is that supplement for? The supplement for bruising and sore muscles. So for treating bruising and sore muscles. Did you have any history that uh, Tammy Daybell had a history of easily bruising? I didn't see any, no. Did you see anything that suggested that Tammy Daybell had bruises on her body uh, at the time she passed away? Yes, there was some. Yeah, and you're aware that- so This to me, I think, is looking forward to show, you know, the bruising wasn't with strangulation or at the time that they're going to say he committed the homicide, but instead she bruised easily and they were seen or, or thought to be old bruises. Those bruises were old bruises, right? Uh, I don't recall. Okay. And if, doc, if if Brenda Dye put in her report that they were old bruises, uh, you would have no reason to dispute that, right? Uh, yeah, no reason. Okay. To but Tammy Daybell clearly, Tammy Daybell clearly was taking medication for bruising, right? That's what the report says. Yeah. That's what the report says, right?
and we're going to try to do this, you know, skilled I really am, right? But at the very bottom, it starts with the last sentence. I was later advised by the coroner, if you could read that for me. I was later advised by the coroner that Tamara's son told her he also takes fluoxetine from the same bottle as his mother. I was also advised that Chad. So again, when we start to get into, you're going to hear some of the kids' names mentioned in these reports. I expect that to be a big part of their testimony. Hold. Told the coroner that sometimes Tamara had minor shaking fits consistent with seizure activity. Tamara's daughter, Emma, also advised the coroner that she takes clogging classes with her mother, and her mother has seemed to slow down in her movements in the last couple months. Tamara had also been saying she felt out of her body recently. Okay. So, again, um, Mr. Daybell is talking to the coroner, or Officer Greenall, and it talks about the fact that um, Tammy's having seizures and that she's having fits shaking and that her daughter is saying that she's slowed down and she's not able to keep up and that she's been... And so I bet a lot of the kids are going to come testify about the health issues of their mother to corroborate this, that it was natural causes and not homicide. This is the most interesting of all of the charges against Chad Daybell. I shouldn't say most interesting. To me, the only one that... The, the most difficult decision the jury is going to have, in my opinion, because I think there's the most evidence of reasonable doubt in this situation that maybe this coroner report is correct. Maybe the death certificate is correct. They're official documents, not to say they couldn't be correct or that it still couldn't be homicide, but this is the one I think that's going to be the toughest for the jury. You're feeling out of sorts, right? Yes. And based on that, you didn't take that into consideration when you decided to dig up Tammy Daybell, did you? No. Okay. The next Tina asked, Peter, how can John Pryor handle this case all alone? I'm not a lawyer, but can't imagine the tremendous amount of work. It's an insane amount of work, but lawyers do do it. He has an investigator. He does have some support. Um, it's very difficult, but it's basically what we're dealt with sometimes. I mean, I, I think I've only tried, tried like one case alone and it was a one day trial. I hate it. I always try a case with at least one other lawyer, um, in our firm. That's, you know, how we do the vast majority of our cases. Um, I just think it's better. Uh, I think it's the best way to do it, but it's not can't do it in every situation. Uh, Morgan P. Does this matter since the judge let the autopsy in? This sounds like a pretrial motion to excuse the autopsy. No, I think it's just for the jury to consider what they believe and what they think is correct and why and how we got here, basically. Ava said, I know many don't like Pryor's style. I don't think he's cringeworthy. He's pulling out what little he has for his client, like most CD criminal defense attorneys do. Welcome to my world as an LPA. That I advised. I advised the corner of everything I had learned from my investigation, and she agreed that the death was a natural one. I had... He's like, Stop. I advised the corner of everything I had learned from my investigation and agreed the death was a natural one. That's Officer Greenow, right? Yes. So the, according to Officer Greenow, in, in, in discussing this with the coroner and with all of this information, came to the conclusion that Tammy's Daybell's death was a natural one. Right? Yes. And you didn't report that to the... Uh, um, the judge when you decided, and, it, and it's not this judge, you didn't report that to the judge when you decided to get a warrant to dig Tammy Daybell up. You didn't mention that to the judge, did you? No. Okay. The last sentence in that paragraph, would you read that one for me? The coroner determined an autopsy was not necessary unless the family wanted one, which they did not. Okay. And then the very last sentence before Officer Greenow, where it says, it was, it was determined by the coroner that the death was due to probable heart attack due to pulmonary edema. Okay. And this is a determination that was made by a coroner at the time of the, uh, uh, of the, the what you call the unattended call uh, of Tammy Daybell, right? Yes. And in talking with the folks down in Gilbert, they told you that Chad knew Lori Vallow, right? Yes. They had no other information about the death of Tammy Daybell, did they? No. You had the information and you're the one who took that information and went in front of a judge and got an order to dig Tammy Daybell up. Yes. And you did it without telling the children that they're digging their mother out of the ground. Is that right? Yes. And you didn't take into consideration the seizures, did you? No. You didn't take into consideration the shaking, did you? No. You didn't take into consideration the anemia, did you? No. You didn't take in any of the medical information other than you told the judge, there's no medical history here. That's what you told the judge, isn't it? Off the medical records, yes. Off the medical records, right? Yes. You didn't look at anything else, right? No. You didn't look at the certificate of death that says pulmonary edema. Heart issues, did you? I did not see that, no. You didn't see it or you didn't look? I didn't look. Judge, I'm, I'm done. Um, I... All right. Now, there is evidence, um, and we'll see what the jury comes down to, but I thought that was an effective cross. I thought that was 
how you use documents and prior statements and evidence. And that's how you create reasonable doubt because the state has to pre prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And they very well may do it. And they did present a lot of evidence. And again, I have an hour with you to break down some things. And especially we look at the legal stuff and some of the evidence, some of the lawyering, some of the judging and decisions made there. Um, so I want to make sure you guys know that there are other parts. And of course, a lot of you are watching the whole trial and know that I'm going to just hit some highlights that we can discuss together and answer a lot of questions. Um, as many as I can. And Ash asked earlier, Peter, for my civil litigation class, I have to do a case note from a Florida civil case, either Florida Supreme Court or Florida Court of Appeals, any suggestions? Oof. Um, I, a very interesting case is not up to the Court of Appeals yet, but it will be as the Take Care of Maya case. There's a lot of very interesting issues there. Um, while I don't have a specific case in mind, I do think juror misconduct is a really interesting one that you know I've gone back through and done a lot of research on with some of the cases where jurors are not honest on their questionnaire or give incomplete information on their questionnaire and how you deal with that afterwards. I think that's really interesting. Um, uh, post remedial measures where like if there's a dangerous condition that a company fixes, you can't use it against them in trial that they fixed that. Um, that's another interesting one in Florida that we deal with a lot. Um, uh, let me think privilege log. What's privilege? What do they have to turn over? What's work product? What's not? There's some interesting case law on that. Um, there's so many different, uh, just like legal arguments you could research to find something, but I don't have a specific case off the top of my head. Um, a lot of people saying, I have no reasonable doubt about what happened to Tammy. I get it. And I do think that the generally bad guy rule is going to apply to Chad Daybell. And I think that all of this stuff piled on top of each other is going to be very, very difficult for Chad Daybell to overcome because they're going to have the conversations with Lori, they're going to have the connections to Alex Cox, the connections to Lori Vallow. They're going to have the slew of um, evidence that piles up against him at his house, where they were found, where he was, him trying to drive off while they were there, the comments that he made. I mean, it's just going to be piling and piling and piling on top that I think it's going to be so hard for them to have any reasonable doubt or think, yeah, we're going to let this guy back out on the streets. Now, if they convict on any, everything, but not Tammy Daybell, he's still going to prison for the rest of his life. We're looking at the death penalty. So it's not like they let him out on the streets. It's a potential kind of um, compromise verdict. I don't know that we'll get there here, but Maria said, sorry, but you only seem to cover the defense. So the re one of the reasons for that is, and by the way, the entire video of him in the car in 45 minutes of this one hour video that I'm doing here was on the prosecution's evidence and the prosecution's questions to the law enforcement officers with Chad sitting in the cop car. So the vast majority of today's video was the prosecutor's evidence. Um, so I'm not just covering the defense. I did just cover the defense's opening statement, but I find the cross-examination very interesting and so much different and so much better than Lori Vallow's case. A lot of the state's case is very similar. And we've talked about it a lot in the Lori Vallow case. We'll continue to talk about it in the Chad Daybell case as well. But again, one hour, I try to pack absolutely as much in as I can. I can't hit the whole, you know, multiple days of testimony in my, you know, one hour recap, but send me clips. If you guys think there's really interesting clips of, a piece of evidence by the prosecution, like the um, dash cam footage today, um, send it to me. We can break it down and I'll try to find mostly what I pick to choose and cover in the content is what most of you guys send me. The more of you that ask, the more likely it is we're going to cover it on the channel. Nirvana, daily thoughts on strength of the prosecutor. Uh, I, I think I think they're doing fine. I don't think it's a home run. I don't think they're crushing. I think they're doing fine. I think they're doing enough. That would be my That would be my assessment at this point. P-Hop, didn't he say she was already cold? How did she roll off the bed? A lot of it doesn't make sense. I don't know. And then if he did this, then he lays in bed next to her. I mean, just if you let your mind go, which the jurors I'm sure are, it's it's not good. It's not good. And I, I get where you're going, P-Hop, and I think the jurors will think the same way. Gringa, is it unlawful to not get the family's position or permission? It depends. Um, there are some reasons, like you don't want them to go tamper with it or do anything about it. Um, you want to be able to do it and potentially not tip anybody off to it. If it's part of a criminal investigation, there are exigent circumstances. Generally speaking, I think you should, um, and you still can, but they didn't in this case, I would have to look and see what the laws are in the land because, um, I, I think there are some objections and problems they could have with it, but, uh, they didn't have to in this case. Um, somebody said, please, Peter Moore, YSL. It's hilarious. Send me clips, Nina, send me clips. Uh, at Tragos Law and at Lawyer You Know on all social medias. 
um, DM me some clips. And if enough people do, like I said, we will break it down. We will break it down. So I appreciate you guys joining me during this lunch break, um, during the trial. Hit that like button if you guys haven't already. And please make sure you um, subscribe to the channel because we love when more voices come in um, and we hear from as many people on how they feel and what they think about the situation, how they break it down, how they would break it down if they were a jury. So I uh, appreciate everybody so much for joining me as always. Um, but till next time, I'm out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tregos, The Lawyer You Know.